Hello, I present today a new episode of Euro Integrators programs, and my guest today is Alex Lenars, ambassador of Kingdom of Belgium, and Katerina Kruk, analyst of Stop Fake. Hi. Last March, uh, Belgium uh, received Ukrainian soldiers injured in Donbass for treatment. Uh, could you please tell us more about this project? Yes, of course, but uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, receiving me uh, to meet a uh, representative of uh, media and civil society. So, uh, uh, regarding uh, the soldiers, uh, I proposed and it was decided by the, the government to pursue uh, this uh, military and medical uh, cooperation uh, with Ukraine. So we will uh, welcome uh, five uh, uh, wounded, heavily uh, wounded soldiers uh, in our hospital, uh, specialized uh, hospital in, uh, in Brussels. Actually, we already welcome uh, three of them. And uh, of course, uh, all the treatment uh, will be covered by the, the Belgian government. It's very important to support uh, uh, the Ukrainian army, and uh, that's why we do that. What can you tell about economical cooperation between, between Ukraine and Belgium, and how uh, Belgium investors feel themselves in Ukraine? So, uh, first of all, um, I'm here in, in your country since uh, seven months. And uh, I'm impressed by the, the, the huge uh, potential of uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, economy, uh, agrarian uh, sector, industrial uh, sector, IT, transport. So we try to improve uh, our economic uh, relation. So we have now uh, more and more uh, investment in your country. We have a uh, big uh, investment or medium or small size uh, investment, for example, uh, in Bath, uh, brewery. So if you drink uh, uh, beer in Ukraine, you have a, a good chance uh, to, to drink uh, Belgian beer, actually. Maybe you don't know, but uh, I will not make uh, publicity <laughs> for, <laughs> for the brand, but uh, um, we have a, a medium-sized uh, investment like uh, Puratos, for example, in Odessa, or IT uh, investment in, uh, in Lviv, electricity investment in uh, Ternopil, that's only a few examples. And we also have uh, investor uh, in agriculture. So the, the investor uh, uh, are uh, concerned of the, the, the huge potential of, uh, of Ukraine. They are really satisfied, they are really satisfied, uh, especially the biggest uh, investor here in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, some problem, I must confess that we have some problem uh, in uh, agriculture, in agrarian uh, uh, sector, and that's why uh, we need uh, more uh, rule of law uh, in, in Ukraine, but uh, I see that uh, Things are changing, so because I know uh, I met uh, Ukrainian authorities, uh, different uh, governor, for example, and they promised to, to change the situation for our Belgian investor. This year, uh, Belgium and European Union will have their own election. You will have a local election, federal election, and European Parliament election. What do you expect from this? three elections so uh, yeah it will be a, a long process in in belgium on uh, may uh, 26 uh, so we will uh, renew our majority in the in the region in for the federal uh, parliament and government and obviously for the the, the european uh, election uh, regarding the, the, the situation in Belgium, it's, uh, it's stable, so we don't uh, expect uh, big uh, changes, but uh, we also have in, in Belgium multi-party uh, majority, so the, the most difficult is not the election, it's after the election to find a majority. That's for Belgium. So now uh, regarding the, the, the European uh, election, uh, I think that we will have uh, some changes uh, in the, the European Parliament uh, because now we see that the, the, the biggest uh, European party, uh, I mean the Popular Party, the Social Democrat Party, 
uh, will maybe we don't know but if if we see the, the, the polls now they, they will lose uh, some uh, members and uh, we will see uh, other uh, movements so uh, now everything is changing in Europe and we'll see it, it will be interesting so you are as analyst of stop fake and you were studying in Belgium working in Belgium uh, do you f have seen maybe or do you expect some influence into this three elections and in overall on public opinion in Belgium. So first of all started with starting with European elections. I think that for the Russian disinformation efforts this will be the main target. Uh, with Belgian ones I do I do believe there will be much less of the concern for the disinformation machine. But when it comes to the European elections which will take place in May just in a month actually in a month's time uh, we already see that uh, this has been a great worry for many European and Ukrainian experts of course who already for several months have been working on different tools how to actually see through uh, the different disinformation activities first of all this is uh, multi-targeting and micro-targeting on social media and uh, the European elections they actually are seen as um, in a way case study uh, on the grand 20 EU member countries scale of what uh, disinformation efforts can bring, and can bring and how can actually they influence the, the results of the elections. So this is indeed a big concern. But once again, when it comes to Belgian elections, I do believe that Belgians can be more or less secure and, uh, and know that Russians won't be targeting them much. Uh, when it comes to Belgium in the eyes of Russian disinformation, I do believe that there is a need to distinguish Belgium as a country and Brussels as a capital, but also as a host city of headquarters of NATO and European Union, European institutions. Um, because definitely there have been um, different attitude to those two entities. Belgium in general uh, is being criticized or ra rather mocked uh, along the narratives towards the greater Europe, meaning that this is a decadent West. Uh, there are no moral, moral authorities, different sexual and religious minorities. They take over the country and so on and so forth. But uh, what is really very much interesting in the context of uh, Belgium over the, uh, of the, over the last years, we have seen probably two major campaigns which were targeting Be Belgian citizens. The first one was in the moment when the European Union has introduced sanctions against Russia, uh, answering obviously the Russian invasion in Ukraine, and Russia has introduced counter sanctions also in agri, agri sector. And there is a great campaign which was targeting many uh, very strongly agricultural countries, yeah. but also France and obviously Belgium, um, making people think that actually those are sanctions, sanctions of the EU. It's Itself, uh, that actually harming the business and the second one uh, which has been repeated over the few years and even in the latest weeks we can actually saw uh, we have seen uh, those events that Russian disinformation sometimes is targeting Belgium uh, for its military operations or rather pretending or introducing fakes that Belgian uh, Belgian Air Force along with uh, Na other NATO countries and other partners has been targeting civilian infrastructure in Syria. Uh, I, I'm agreed with you, uh, Katerina, about um, that the biggest target is actually Brussels for uh, disinformation. Because when I was in Brussels first time as a deputy minister for European integration, the first uh, thing we saw in each restaurant and in each hotel, it was English language newspaper totally devoted to promote Russia and Putin against Ukraine, against the sanction, against European Union integration. Officially, it was said that it uh, was done by Greece. It was called New Europe. But in reality, I'm sure it was done for Russian money, as well as all city was in um, placards of Russian ballot. And uh, in TV, all TV channels, which was in uh, um, our hotel, uh, I think the half was Russian TV channels, even English language, but still Russian. So it's the biggest targets, and the uh, government of Belgium is doing something about it. Uh, I share uh, your view on, on this information. There is a real risk, and uh, we already, as you mentioned, uh, have uh, this information in, in, in Belgium, so uh, we must be very careful. <coughs> of course, um, Belgian national election will not be a, a, a target, but European election will be a target. I'm sure of, uh, of this. So we must be uh, very careful. So <clears throat> we have uh, now uh, reinforced our uh, cyber uh, attack security, anti-cyber attack uh, security uh, in Belgium. We have uh, some special program uh, about it. 
And uh, for example, in, uh, in my ministry uh, of foreign affairs, uh, we had uh, a few years ago a cyber attack. In, in my Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's why we are very careful. Katya, what can you say about the main channels of uh, Russian influence in Belgium? So first of all, I have to mention that when we're talking about disinformation efforts or information warfare efforts, it is really very narrow only to think about fake news and only to think about fake narratives. In general, we have seen in Europe in the last years that there is an entire plethora of different methods. So obviously, uh, sharing fake news and micro-targeting of people, this is the tip of an, of, of an iceberg. The next level will be uh, the Russian TV channels, radio stations, newspapers, which are branded as, as owned by Russians and so on and so forth. For example, Sputnik and Russia today, uh, they have their language versions almost in every European country. They are, they are indeed major. But what goes beneath this level is um, different attitudes or different attempts of Russians to uh, get into the already existing uh, media outlets in different European countries. So for example, uh, the TV station or radio station, which won't be branded as Sputnik or Russia today, you won't find that actually there are Russians standing behind it. But if you will see the form of the ownership or who is financing those campaigns, you will actually see that there is a Russian side um, also taking part in it. The second level, and this is something that in general in Europe um, there is awakening to this kind of problem, uh, this is the challenge with experts, with different conferences, think tank, analytical centers, which uh, aren't closely uh, directly tied to Russia, or you won't find Russian surnames over there, but they are the ones who are introducing the Russian narratives into the public debate. Or, for example, they are supporting the Russian narratives. I think that European sanctions and the way that uh, Europe should return to the strategic and normal relationship with Russia, this is the most, uh, the most popular narrative that is being pressed or pushed forward by those analytical centers. And the last, the most troubling uh, level is actually financial support of political parties and different uh, political or marginal groups in all around the Europe. Um, first of all, Russians have seen that they are ready to support uh, groups, uh, radical groups on all the different uh, levels, starting from uh, far right to far left. So uh, the more radical they are, I mean, the, the color, the, the color doesn't, doesn't matter for Russians. But also what we have seen on the example of France, where uh, Marine Le Pen, who actually made it to the second round of presidential elections just a few years ago, last year we have seen the confirmation that her party has received money directly from Russia, obviously via the proxy bank in Czech Republic, but uh, we have already seen the evidence that Russians actually financing politicians who have very strong anti-European rhetorics, first of all not only pro-Russian per se, but uh, disintegrating European Union from the inside. Uh, I would say that Belgium actually started to do something, because I know that you cannot speak about that, but according to media, uh, they already uh, take from position the person from counterintelligence unit who was connected to Russia, and now this uh, case is in court. But what else are uh, Belgium doing about such deep influence, let's say? It? So, um what I want to say is that uh, even if the, there is uh, disinformation and narrative, and there is disinformation, we, are, we, we know that, uh, it will not change uh, our position. Because in, in Belgium, we have a, a very strong uh, political position. We fully support the integrity, the sovereignty of Ukraine. And we will not change. We will maintain the sanction against Russia till the Federation of Russia will change its, its policy. And that's the very clear political position. We will not change. So we have our values. And our values is uh, the respect of international law. Now, now we are in the, the Security Council of the United Nations. And every month, <laughs> we will repeat it. So we are in favor of international law. And, every country has to respect international law. And that's the case in, in Crimea, for example. So, and that's why we will not change our position. So uh, some people can try to, to uh, make a disinformation, uh, or to, uh, but it will not change our position. What is uh, Belgium's position or reaction on the Yellow West protest? Yeah, well, uh, this movement, uh, uh, is more uh, in, in France than uh, in, in other countries. So there was 
some uh, beginning of uh, protest uh, in Belgium, but in, uh, it was unsuccessful. So uh, now it's more a, a French uh, movement than a European uh, uh, movement. So. If you ask me my opinion uh, about uh, this uh, movement of uh, Yellow West, I think that uh, in the beginning it was a social protest. But uh, of course we, we have to accept it because we are in democracy. But uh, what we cannot accept is that this movement uh, became then more and more violent. If you remember the, what happened in the so-called Champs Elysees, it's not acceptable. So it's not acceptable, and that's why uh, my government, of course, uh, supports the, the position of the French government uh, about uh, the Yellow Vest. Katya, uh, as an analytic of Stop Fake, uh, have you seen in this Yellow Vest protests? some influence mm -hmm. so obviously stop fake first of all um focuses on uh, observing and very closely looking at russian social media and russian media in general like online tv and so on and so forth so obviously we notice that russians um very work warmly have accepted and uh, welcomed the events in paris uh, and obviously afterwards in the, in the, in the rest of France. But uh, Ukrainian analysts actually were among the first ones saying, look into Russian's hands. Uh, be careful because Russia might use this case in order to, uh, to distort actually the society from the inside. And I must admit that the first reaction of our European colleagues was really very cautious and very distant and very cold. Uh, some people were even saying, look, Ukrainians, you are being a bit paranoid about, about Russia because you see the Kremlin hand everywhere. But uh, it took our European colleagues actually a few months to see that indeed Russia has very heavily influenced uh, the spread about the information of the information about the events in Paris on social media first and foremost. Because obviously there have been uh, cases and voices saying that probably there have been some Russian provocateurs on the streets of Paris demolishing the shops and breaking the windows. Um, there we, we don't have that much of the confirmation. This should come from France, French police first of all. But uh, from the uh, internet culprits and from what um, could actually be checked on Twitter, on Facebook and on other social media, those who are actually French and, and other European analysts who after some, some time said, yes, indeed Russia has used this situation in order, in a way to popularize uh, the movement and their destructive messages within the French uh, society and obviously in other countries of Europe. So to put it very shortly, obviously Russia doesn't stand 100% behind the Yellow West protests, but they are definitely using the situation in order to destabilize France from the inside. Uh, what do you think about last statements of Macron and Merkel about needness of consolidating, uh, integrating European Union? Do you think that uh, Belgium thinks that uh, this integration needed now? So uh, we, uh, Belgium. <coughs> um, was one of the six uh, founder uh, member states of the European Union with Germany and, and France, so the, the, the country of uh, President Macron and uh, Madame Merkel. So uh, indeed, uh, we support uh, this initiative because uh, we need to, to repeat uh, what are our values, what are our values, the values of the, the, the European Union. and. Uh, if you remember, uh, the, our parents or grandparents founded the, the, the European Union uh, with the former enemies. So, for example, the French and the, the Belgian, we did it uh, with the Germans. So, uh, and that's, uh, uh, it's, uh, the European Union is more a, a peace project than an economic project. Of course, it's an economic uh, project, but uh, it's, uh, we, we forgot uh, these values of peace, democracy, and, and other values. And that's why uh, this initiative of uh, Madame Merkel and uh, President Macron is so important. Yeah. I think that we, we need it. We need to, to repeat it. What's the, what is the, the, the basis of the, the union. Belgium is supporting uh renewal of sanctions against Russia for their aggression in Ukraine. Uh, in the same time, Belgium supports European Union uh, position towards Nord Stream 2. Tell us, please, why you're doing, because it's a bit 
from Ukrainian's point of view, it's a bit contradictory about yeah. things. And uh, what is pluses and minuses of this, both positions? The most important is uh, to maintain and to renew the, the sanction against Russia. We don't have to, to change this position. We have to, to stay very strong. And uh, the second part of, uh, of your question, I would say that's exactly the, the balance we have to find between the values, I spoke about values, and what we call uh, real politics and economy. That's why, uh, regarding uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, we are in favor of a uh, European position. Why? Because we need uh, uh, a European compromise uh, that can satisfy uh, all European countries, including uh, Germany, uh, but, but we have also uh, to, to, to defend and to support the Ukraine uh, uh, interest in this issue. Uh, how do you expect to do that? Uh, so we have to find a, a, a solution, including transit, the uh, transit uh, in Ukraine, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how both of you mm -hmm. rate the uh, possibility for Ukraine in some period of time achieve uh, opportunity to be a member of NATO and EU? So first of all, uh, in Belgium University and College of Europe, I was actually studying European Union and European integration. So, um, and it was already after the Maidan uh, revolution in 2014 in Ukraine. And obviously, uh, even for European scholars, for European students, Ukraine became one of the central points, uh, also sometimes a subject of internal European questions and processes. But obviously, European Union is a project on different levels. So you already discussed the, the ideological, it's, it's the way the mission of the European Union as it was declared by the founding countries and the founding fathers. But also this is the project, uh, first of all, economic, um, in energy, in cyber and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different layers. And although it's pretty much obvious, not only in Ukraine, but also in the majority of European countries, that Ukraine is a European country. We belong to Western civilization. So our membership in European Union is just a political symbol, it's like political ending point of this process. Uh, and we obviously have to, to move forward in that direction. Uh, Ukraine has very strongly manifested over the last five years uh, its willingness, its civilizational choice and obviously strategical and geopolitical choice of moving into the European Union and strengthening and deepening the integration with both EU and NATO. Uh, we even amended our constitution recently saying that those are the strategic uh, directions of development of Ukraine. Uh, but still, I mean, as Ukrainians, we have to admit that we don't have a clear answer from Brussels in this case, from the European Union in general. NATO has been much more clear in this stance, saying that if Ukraine is ready to meet the criteria, Ukraine is welcome. Uh, with the European Union, the situation is much more ambiguous. We don't have neither a clear yes nor clear no. And obviously, in Ukraine, we should understand that it's not only about the relations between EU, EU and Ukraine in general, but also it's very much about the processes within the European Union. First of all, the view of integration, the need of further integration, but also disintegration processes and problems, internal ones that EU is facing. But for Ukraine, it's incredibly important to maintain on this road of changes, because obviously we have to meet a lot of different standards, both in the political life, but also when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the level of corruption, when it comes to the level of the effectiveness of the state and, and level of the life of people in general. So moving in that direction is crucially important for us. And if we will continue doing that, then I do believe that at some point both EU and Ukraine will be ready to talk about the next stage of the integration, which is the becoming a member. And what is your opinion? I share, I share uh, this view. Uh, I came uh, in September to your beautiful country and my first speech was uh, about uh, Ukraine and the uh, European Union. And I, I, I told uh, as Belgium ambassador, I say Belgium and Ukraine, uh, we are in the same family, the European family. I'm uh, totally convinced that uh, Ukraine is a uh, Ukraine is a European country. So I fully support this uh, European perspective of uh, Ukraine, and uh, I see that uh, more and more uh, Ukrainian, and especially the young generation now is in favor of, the, the European, uh, of this uh, European uh, perspective, and that's very positive. But, of course, uh, it will take time. It will take time. Sometimes 
uh, we compare uh, Ukraine uh, with Poland, for example. But uh, for Poland too, it took time to join the, the European Union. So we, we also uh, must be clear and tell the truth to the Ukrainian citizen. We, we don't have to, to be a liar. So uh, we fully support this perspective, this Euro and also Atlantic uh, perspective. Uh, uh, we have to uh, support the, the, the Ukrainian society to change. We need more reforms, of course. We need more reforms, for example, in judicial. <laughs> we, we really need it. So, uh, and, uh, but uh, you are on the good direction, on the good way. So I'm sure of this. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Katerina, for joining our program. Thanks to all who watched us. See you next week.